Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Luke Bennett. Welcome to uh, our um, final uh, event in the series People in Property uh, 2021. Uh, tonight we're going to be hearing from eight uh, of our uh, alumni and professional contacts on the subject of getting to the top in real estate. And uh, we are going to um, uh, get underway very shortly, uh, but just before we do so, uh, a little bit of housekeeping and a little bit of a promo from me. Um, we have been doing real estate related courses, uh, both at undergraduate and master's level for um, nigh on 40 years now under various names. Some of the people you'll be hearing from this evening uh, will have studied under different titles, uh, most notably urban land economics, which had had very strong purchase for a number of uh, a number of years. Um, more recently, we've introduced degree apprenticeships and also uh, international um, uh, teaching uh, related courses. And of course, we've got the, um, the master's um, uh, variant, which is a professional conversion course, uh, also uh, available to uh, non-cognate uh, undergraduates. So this evening, we're going to be um, gathering in the views of our, um, our guests over two um, sub panels. I'm going to chair the first sub panel, uh, which will be starting shortly. Um, and then uh, the second sub panel will be chaired by my colleague, uh, James Johnston. Um, each uh, presenter is going to introduce themselves and speak for five minutes, um, targeting their thoughts towards giving you a flavor of who they are and what their background is and how they came to be who they, who they are and how they feel about who they are. Um, and in doing so, uh, they're going to address a particular angle, particular perspective that I've asked them to come at their um, presentation from. Uh, then for each panel, we'll have 15, possibly 20 minutes at the end for uh, discussion before handing over, in, in my case, to the second panel that will come along uh, after me. So um, with, no, uh, with no further uh, ado, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to invite Ian, Ian Scott, to, um, to start us off. Here comes Ian. Uh, yeah, have you, have you got me, Luke, yeah? Uh, got you, yeah, lovely, thank you, Ian. Oh, brilliant. Uh, hi, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here tonight to kind of share a bit of uh, perspective. And uh, it's, it's absolutely flattering that uh, Luke and the team at, at Shepherd Hallam obviously think that I'm, uh, I'm doing okay in my career, <laughs> um, which is nice. Um, I, what I'll do, I'll, I'll give you kind of a bit of a potted history about um, how I started off and then and then where, where I've ended up and what else we've, we've got going on and how we're kicking on at, at LSH. Um, and I started at Shepherd Hallam in 2011 and I had the pleasure of being taught, uh, I think it was uh, real estate law or built environment law actually, Luke, by, by you. Um, and I went to LSH in 2013 uh, on, on my placement year. And, um, and from there I've, I've, I've ended up being part of the establishment, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but but I've, I've not left, um, which is interesting because I think these days people do seem to fleet around uh, more often than not. Um, so it's, it's actually quite rare for, for someone to, to stay at a firm for so long uh, when, you, when you're at such a young age. Um, so we, yeah, we, we, well, I ended up in the valuation team to start with, which was great, great grounding. Um, I think everybody in the career should, should or general practice in particular, general practice today should have a bit of time in valuation because it certainly helps you just get to the, get into the nitty gritty of different asset classes, different locations and the general principles of, of value and, and, and property investment overall. Um, and from there, I, I, I decided that, that, that I wasn't destined to be a, a valuer for the rest of my career. So I decided to um, be a bit bold. And I, I asked the head of office at the time if I could have an opportunity before I went back to to university to, to have a, a bit of a, um, a seat in the capital markets team. So then I moved into capital markets and investment agency uh, for, for about 12 months actually after that, which was great because I, again, had a very similar experience in, because I was a regional um, surveyor rather than a London-based surveyor. I was able to uh, work across different asset classes, whereas generally speaking, when you're in, in London, in, in the bigger firms, you tend to 
uh, start to focus on a sector early doors. So it was great. Again, you know, we were we were one one minute we were trading a, an office building in central Manchester for fifty million pounds, and then then the next day we'd be selling a a, a tertiary retail scheme for a million pounds in in the, the likes of Bolton or Rochdale. So um, it was again great varied experience, and. Um, and from there, uh, I, I went back to university, then came back to the business, and we uh, I got asked to join a, a guy called Nick Mullins, who was who was from CBRE, who was just joining the firm, and to set up the development funding team. Um, so we we wrote a business plan, set up a development funding team, and we were going to focus on, uh, funnily enough, residential BTR student accommodation, and um, and sheds industrial, which obviously is a market that's gone gone crazy recently. Um, and and then Nick left after about twelve months, and I don't, don't don't even know the reason why he did leave after twelve months, but but he did for whatever reason, and I felt a bit hurt about it because we spent the last twelve months really you know driving an agenda together and, and pushing the business forward, um, and they tried to recruit to replace uh, Nick, and they, they basically couldn't find a replacement. So the, the chief exec Ezra, um, who I've who I've now got a great working relationship with, um, basically said to me, and, and bear in mind this was in two thousand and kind of. 15, 16, so I would have been 23, 24. Um, he asked me to, to submit a business plan to him to, to run the development funding team, at which point I totally focused on our time and effort on the build to rent market because, again, back then it was uh, the most emerging market, again, in, in, the regional, in the regional sphere of investment. It was, it was hot to trot and there was plenty of opportunity. And it was all development funding led, so forward funding agreements and land deals, which is what I was more interested in than trading uh, general investments. Um, so they obviously liked the business plan because then he appointed me as, as kind of the national head. Uh, and at the age of 25, I was promoted to director um, of LSH and, and national head of BTR, which was very daunting at the time. Um, and it's still sometimes it is, is still daunting. Um, and, and when I've kind of wrote down the dates today to, to run through kind of year by year, it's actually kind of unbelievable to see what kind of has happened across the last uh, kind of eight years or so um, and the progression that, that I have made. And I, I often don't think that many of us sit back and think about, um, you know, what has happened and what has changed across that period of time, but it's absolutely drastic. Um, all, all positive though, I'd like to think. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we've gone from strength to strength. So in 2019 and 20, we had uh, stellar years. We, you know, we were, we were one of the best performing teams across the entire business. Uh, my team is now eight people across the UK. Uh, and we focus primarily on land deals, forward funding deals and uh, trading investment products. So one of the biggest deals we, we did recently was we sold a building for 90 million pounds to Europa Capital. Um, I think you heard from um, Rob Sim from Europa a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we sold a, a building to them in Manchester, which, which was a great one. And again, that put us on the map. So we've really been driving brand awareness and, and uh, almost as well kind of a, um, a young, hungry team as opposed to, uh, to being kind of maybe a bit slow like some of the big firms can be. We've, we've badged ourselves up as young, hungry and nimble, uh, which seems to have worked quite well. Um, so that's a that's a, a kind of a potted history, and, and of course, yeah. When you know, at the end of the summaries of, of everybody else, I'm happy to take any any questions that anyone might have. Lovely, thanks very much, Ian, for starting us off. Uh, next to um, Stephen, please. Hi, good evening um, to everyone. To two apologies for me for, for when we start. First is my voice. I've got flu, not COVID. I had my test today, but uh, my voice normally doesn't sound like this. Uh, and there may be some interruptions from one of one of my many children. So if they arrive, I, I apologise. I'm guessing everyone's used to that today. Uh, so I thought I'd start with where I am today, and then really how how I got there. Um, so so today I'm the I'm the chief executive of um, a company called HB Revis. Uh, we are the largest developers uh, of offices in in Europe. Um, we have something like 15 million square feet of of development of office buildings. Uh, I run the UK business. Uh, that business has something like three, three and a half billion pounds worth of um, assets, assets by, by GDV. And I suppose, you know, the interesting or maybe the interesting thing for people is, is how, how I ended up in that position relatively early on in my career. So, you know, my, my journey to become a CEO was, was a really mixed one and probably not that usual. So you know, obviously I'm a Sheffield Hallam graduate, um, but I'm also a university dropout almost times two so I actually started at Sheffield University doing economics uh, dropped out of that 
I uh, spent a year working, doing all sorts of jobs, laboring, working in shops, bars, restaurants, whatever, just trying to earn some money. Realised that was pretty difficult. Um, then started doing the real estate course at Hallam. I'd say scraped through a first year, pretty much failed a second year, uh, and then had a choice to make um, if it was something I really wanted to do. Some things happened in my external life, which, which really focused me on wanting to achieve something. So then I kind of put all my fits into redoing my second year. Um, I then had probably one of the one of the best experiences of my career, which was my first experience of real work, like in a professional environment. So my third year was spent uh, on placement year, which I, I would advise everybody to do if they get the opportunity, uh, working for Leeds City Council, which was about as glamorous as it sounds, to be honest. Um, but it was, it was great experience. Um, at the end of that, I managed to somehow get some work experience working for Savills in London. Uh, I was pretty naive. I just wrote handwritten letters to all the agencies out of the back of the States Gazette. Didn't really know how it worked. Managed to get some experience with, with Savills. Um, and they offered me a job uh, for when I'd finished my, my degree. Uh, and I just paused there and see, you know, that's, that's kind of a theme for me, which is one of slight luck, uh, creating opportunity and really maximizing it. So, you know, when I went to Savills, I did the first half a day of my um, summer placement in the hotels team, which would have been terrible for me because it wasn't the best team. They then moved me out of there because uh, someone, one of the other summer students hadn't turned up in, in valuation. And I spent the next three or four months in valuation. That was a great team for me and actually offered me a job um, like I said, for when I, when I finished. So I went back to university, finished the degree, uh, then rejoined Savills in London. And then I was really fast-tracked through the APC process because I'd, I'd spent the first year at Leeds City Council. So that was the first year of my APC. So I was then only, uh, and actually it was a year at Leeds City Council, three, four months at Savills. So I only had nine months or so to do to actually get through my APC. So they fast-tracked me through that. Uh, on completing the APC, uh, settled in the city investment team, which was probably one of the most prized and coveted slots uh, in, in Savills. And that was really because somebody else had decided to take an opportunity in, in the US for Savills. So again, you know, seeing an opportunity uh, and taking it. After a few years of that, and I suppose a few a few resignations from, from, from me, they offered me uh, a job with a colleague to create um, an international capital markets desk focused on Asia. Uh, this is back in 2010 or 11, really before uh, we saw the growth in that market. So again, so uh, was offered an opportunity, made the most of it. I then decided to leave Savills because uh, it was getting a bit too too big for me. I prefer being in a smaller entrepreneurial environment. I left to go and work for BNP Paribas, uh, being a director in their city investment team. I think after after a year there, they they said, please go and run our West End investment team because again, somebody had decided to leave. Uh, after a year there, uh, I was then asked to run the whole office. So this is, I don't know, probably... 27 now at this point we're in, we're in the whole office which was slightly different uh because it was running an entire business and, and pnl rather than being kind of frontline fee fee generating and then at the end of 2016 um i joined hb revis where i've kind of been happy ever since uh, i've been the ceo for the last three years originally joined looking after the, the property side and i run everything uh in terms of like how i got here i'm really not too sure and you know to give people some hope. There's really nothing special about me uh, whatsoever. I think I was quite lucky and then just maxed out on the opportunities. Um, I think I was a little bit strategic in the career plan to build up the experience that I would need for the job that I wanted rather than the job that I currently had. Um, and I would say, you know, you need some luck to create the opportunity, but when the, the opportunity presents itself, take it. You know, I see many times, even when we offer people um, opportunity or different roles internally, they're, they're reluctant to take risk. Um, and I'm not sure that's the way to fast track yourself through, through your career. Uh, in terms of kind of mindset to get there quickly, and when I say these comments, I'm talking about myself, not, um, not talking about people that work uh, with me. Um, you know, I think one of the best things you can do is become useful to somebody and really trusted, trusted by them. I think you really have to work out how you can offer something to somebody they don't already have or can't do um, themselves and then do absolutely everything you can to never let those people down. That they really trust you, that you're really gonna go the extra mile, go somewhere where other people wouldn't go um, to make sure you do what you said you, um, you, you would do. Um, and you know, it might sound a bit harsh, but 
you know, if you want to get somewhere quickly, I think you've got to take some risk. And if you want that exceptional result, I think you really have to be doing something exceptional. You know, ideas are great, but without that kind of uh, exceptional focus on on execution and dedication to the execution, they're just they're just ideas. So, you know, I think if you have all those skills, I think any employer or board uh, will really invest in you and, and kind of push you along quickly. So that's that's my little quick story in five ish minutes. That's great. Thanks very much. You can have a limb set now. Um, right. OK, so uh, now we go to um, Philip, please. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, and greetings, greetings from Doncaster. Um, when I came to, to Sheffield uh, Poly in 1975, uh, I came from came from Portsmouth, knowing nil people in Sheffield. It took me, what, at least 10 minutes before I had a whole group of friends and remained, and many of which have remained friends for forever. And one of them, Ian, is uh, doing a talk uh, this evening. Um, I, uh, I started doing the HND course at Sheffield Poly and um, in land use studies. And uh, by dint of accident, I got a job with the Midland Bank, now HSBC, but they were based in Sheffield, decentralised from London at the Pennine Centre as a premises trainee. In fact, I remember my first month's salary there was 120 quid. Um, wouldn't even buy a good lunch these days, I don't think. But the, the fact is that uh, I, started, I started there and uh, did my degree day release at, at Nottingham Trent, but still maintaining my links with Sheffield Poly. In fact, when I became a rugby union referee, I just annoyed the Sheffield Hallam Rugby Club by calling them Sheffield Poly and say Poly ball, ball, ball in. But I, uh, I, I enjoyed my time at Midland Bank. And I enjoyed my time in Sheffield. In fact, I still continue to do a careers talk and a talk about current events to the students. I did it for about 30 years until the, the, uh, uh, the group of uh, 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 lecturers uh, retired. Um, uh, Phil Croft, uh, for example, uh, retired mm -hmm. and others. So um, uh, I, I did that for a long time. And I've, all pre I've always been prepared to put something back because Giving away my intellectual property is a sign of success. I want to, people to, to, to build on my knowledge and to have to take it on a lot further. I got as far as I could with Midland Bank, qualified as a charter surveyor, but sought uh, pastures new. And I went to, to Doncaster, which is where I now live, and worked for the government's uh, regeneration agency, as it was at the time, English Estates. And I had five and a half really good years there uh, including um, uh, undertaking the ultimate piece of vandalism on the uh, our college campus by building the science park, which I note actually on Monday is now being demolished after 30, 33 years. But it was the first B1 development in Doncaster, in, oh, sorry, in Sheffield for about 20 years uh, because of the dearth of investment. From there, I got a job with uh, the Grover Estate, John Lang Joint Venture, uh, Grover Lang Urban Enterprise, putting into effect uh, regeneration ambitions. In fact, I've built one and a quarter million square feet of commercial floor space as a property developer, development manager, and I was a P&D trained uh, uh, um, uh, uh, surveyor. I enjoyed that immensely until the, you know, the, the company decided to go a uh, different way in the early 90s, and I set up my own practice. Now, I had a lot of interest in brownfield regeneration because I was picking up the pieces of the coal closures, the steel closures, trying to look at the, the bigger picture and trying to sort of create opportunity for disadvantaged economies. And there is still a mountain of work to do in that environment. But I got involved with uh, brownfield work and then contaminated land, which was the big issue in the 90s and still is to a large or, uh, degree today through the planning process and through regulation. And that has morphed into broader environmental issues. And I'm very proud of the work that I've done um, in private practice, which has gone from strength to strength. Although I work now by myself um, from, from home because I decided to call, bring the, the, the business back around me as I uh, enter the, I won't say the autumn of my life, sounds awful, but certainly because um, I think I'm just in the spring of it, but just to move on and uh, to, to do my own thing and to uh, pick and choose the work that I want to do. And that's, that's the beauty of becoming a child of surveyor. And that's the beauty of our education, because it gives us the opportunity to choose what we want to do. Becoming a child of surveyor means it's just the entry point to lifelong learning. I would go over to the opening of a crisp packet if it was necessary, but to get something out of either that networking event, 
that meeting, that event, whatever it may be, but to a thirst for knowledge. Because where you start in your career, I guarantee from all of the speakers uh, that you'll hear from tonight, it is not where you're going to end up. In fact, uh, I'm one of those uh, individuals who regard what I do as a vocation. I enjoy it. And I enjoyed also giving my, my, of myself to RICS, as Louise has and others have, in you know, many, many ways, writing guidance notes, sitting on the Global Valuation Standards Board and contributing um, your knowledge to benefit all of us at society, the markets, but more importantly, we're about people. And I think if we can make an improvement to people's lives, that's a life well led. And becoming a charter surveyor has certainly enabled me to do that. I've had a very full career, to say the least. Um, it's taken me to places that I would never have dreamt of going to the United States, all over Europe, uh, as well as the UK. I'm very active now in environmental matters and uh, looking at how existential threats from the environment impacts on all forms of real estate, underpinning asset valuations, not undermining them. So that really, in a short nutshell, is what I get up to on a daily basis. And um, if anyone's got any questions, throw them at me. Be pleased to hear from you. I hope that's OK. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, and uh, next, we've got Diane, please. Good evening, everyone. I am Diane Elliott, and I am the director of the Land Valuation Department here in the beautiful island of Bermuda. I am currently, um, as I stated, the director, and just so that you can uh, have an equivalent, uh, the department is the equivalent of the Valuation Office Agency in the UK. How did I get here? Uh, with much help from the Bermuda government, quite honestly. Um, leaving high school, contemplating what to do, you know, considered engineering, considered accountancy, and I actually saw a, a job advertised for a junior estate surveyor with the government of Bermuda um, in the Ministry of Works and Engineering. Didn't have all the qualifications, but I applied for it and um, interviewed and was fortunate enough uh, to be given the position. That was way back in August of 1989. And by Christmas, I was uh, offered um, to go to Sheffield Hallam uh, to basically do the urban land economics degree program. And how that came about Sheffield of all places is because Sheffield Poly back in the day used to have a um, student exchange program with the government of Bermuda. So Bermuda had a connection with the university. And so in summer of 90, I uh, left Bermuda and made my way to, to England. Um, I remember when I uh, got off the train and looked across to the um, student union building and I was like, oh my goodness, what is this? What have I gotten myself into? But I stuck it out and four years later, I uh, graduated from uh, with a, bas uh, a master's, sorry, a bachelor of science degree in urban land economics. I then actually uh, worked for two years from 94 to 96 with the, what was then the Sheffield Valuation Office. Um, and that was as um, being seconded from the Bermuda government, which was actually quite brilliant because um, I was a bursary student. And what that meant was that um, as a secondee, oh, I basically paid a Bermudian salary uh, in the UK. So it was actually quite awesome. And so after two years at the Sheffield Valuation Office, I decided it was time to come back to Bermuda. So in 96, I came back to Bermuda as a trainee valuer. Oh, I must add that whilst I was in England, um, I did sit my APC and in the fall- Did I see you there? In the fall of 95, um, basically oh. a member of the RICS. As I was saying, so in 96, I came back to Bermuda as a trainee valuer, and I decided oh. to actually um, continue with the land valuation department as opposed to the estate section in um, works and engineering. 
because I much prefer the valuation and the mathematical side of things as opposed to estate and property management. And since 96, I've basically uh, worked my way up through the department from being the trainee valuer to the valuer, becoming the assistant director, and then in 2013, becoming uh, the director of the department. Um, Leading within um, a government role, what has definitely helped is the fact that I have basically um, sat in pretty much every position. And you know what, that much you can try. Within the department. Um, so that definitely gives you, you know, broad understanding of all the roles uh, that people uh, do within the department. You know, and it, it's just a very holistic understanding of all the facets of the department because I've basically been there, done that. Um, success within government particularly is uh, being flexible, <laughs> believe it or not, flexibility despite the rigidity of government, but flexible and creative in the sense of finding uh, efficiencies through government red tape and bureaucracy um, that would definitely um help one succeed, particularly uh, within government. Um, like Ian, um, government's been my employer all my career thus far. So, but you know, I enjoy it. Um, you have to enjoy it. It is service, it is service oriented. Um, to, to obviously develop a thick skin, you know, govern, I think governments worldwide are probably slagged off. But um, um, you know, it just makes one one resilient. So um, quite pleased that you know I've been offered this opportunity to um, speak and converse with you, and I'm looking forward to the panel discussions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Diane, and apologies for the slight interruptions going on in the background there. Um, okay, so. What I'd like to ask is a question that I think could, could, could be responded to by each of the four panelists, because they've all touched on it to one extent or another. And, and, and if I invite the four to sort of just turn the cameras on for this, that might be, uh, that might be good. Um, do you believe in fate? That's the question. Do you believe in fate? Let's take, uh, let's take it in order so you've all got time to think about it. So we'll take Ian first. Is your success down to fate, sir? Uh, no, oh, no, I don't think fate. I don't think fate exists. I think you you take opportunity, and I think that with opportunity, there is always an element of luck um, as well as good judgment. I think it is a combination. But where where you where you have got a bit of good luck, that's the point where you really do have to grab the ball by the horns and take the opportunity and and drive drive it forward and drive your own agenda. Um, but ultimately, fate. What well, if you sit back and do nothing and and just wait for the world to deliver for you? I, I don't, don't just don't think that's gonna gonna work. You need to be proactive and, and driven ultimately and passionate about what you do. Okay, thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, no, I really don't believe in fate at all. Um, I think I believe way more in hard work, focus, some some dedication. I think if you really have that. Um, you'll put yourself in a position where the fate or the opportunities will come to you. I think that's that's more important than hanging them out, waiting, waiting for fate to happen. Because you know that's that, that's not that doesn't seem like a good business plan to me for okay. your career. Okay, Philip, uh, I'm going to complete a hat trick. Actually, no, you, 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 it's not a question of luck uh, in any shape or form. Um, I've always believed that you never pass up, never pass up on an opportunity. I never want to pass this mortal coil by saying, oh, I wish I had this and I wish I'd done that. Um, and also, um, I said this before, it's about a vocation. You know, you've got to, it's, it's all about the perspiration as well as the 1% inspiration. It's 99% perspiration, you know, you know, walking the streets, you know, putting in the hard yards, the long hours. I mean, this morning I was up at five, I left home at six, I went to the Cotswolds to look at a, a property that had been a, a nursing home that had been flooded to come then come back to do this. So you put in those hard yards all your life, but you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, and also people have work done to them, i.e. they have a, a career that's done to them. They don't take control, the, 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 the jobs in control of them. 
we, I would argue, all of us are in control of our destinies and we've man managed to harness our skills and make those, uh, make, it, make our own destiny out of our, our, our skill sets in all sorts of wonderful sectors. And it's great. Okay, thank you. Diane. I definitely concur with my fellow panelists. Um, definitely do not uh, believe in the, the notion, notion of fate. Of fate. Um, one has to be persistent and deliberate in order to um, succeed in whatever it is, whether that's in the work arena or in your personal lives. Um, I live by, one of my mothers I live by is actually my high school motto, which is respite for now, which basically means keep the and in view. And I think if you're always got that and in view, it will give you that drive and determination to keep moving forward. You know, it's, it's about, you know, as, as Stephen said, taking risks, don't let opportunities pass you by because then you, you do end up living in the world of regret. You know, um, I, one of my other favorite quotes, believe it or not, is Sir Winston Churchill, you know, where he says, success is not fine, failure is not fatal, you know, but it's the courage to keep going on, you know, and so, you know, Failures will come, and that's all a part of maturity, but it's, you know, the courage to keep going on. You know, it's not about fate, it's determining your own destiny. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question that I'm going to try and try and address to, to each and every one of you, because it's another theme that I think has come up um, in what you've, you've been talking about, and, and, and it picks up on something that's in the chat. Um, to what extent is your success to do with having spotted the way in which things were moving, having spotted a new emerging issue, whether environmental or ways in which workplaces needed to evolve or the ways in which student accommodation needed to evolve. W would each of you like to comment on how important it is to be able to have that horizon scanning as part of your career building, starting with Ian? Yeah, you know, 100%, I think for, for me, the build to rent market during the last eight years has just been, you know, phenomenal growth story. And the asset class didn't exist 10 years ago. It was, a, it was an idea, it was a concept. Um, and what we've seen in a, a ten, the 10 year period ultimately is, is the delivery of assets, the operation of assets. And we're now starting to see some of these buildings trade as well. So um, I think that's one of the frustrating things about property actually, is it does seem to take an eternity for, for markets to evolve and mature. Um, but yeah, you know, we were, again, fortunate enough to spot the, the change in the, the private rented sector overall, um, spot the change in, in, in demand um, and customer demand as opposed to tenant demand um, and, and jump on the back of it. And also, you know, really tracking the institutional investor market because ultimately we, we've ended up in a position where many of our clients 10 years ago, again, really didn't have diverse portfolios whatsoever. Uh, they were really light on anything that would be badged alternatives and it was all retail industrial and office um, so yeah you know we tracked that market well, funnily enough the the business plan that we had on funding development was sheds and beds which is the which is the way of the world now so I only wish I would have executed on the sheds business model as well as the uh, the PRS one and probably be in a bit of a different place <laughs> but uh, but yeah the answer is yes you've got it you've got to know what's going on okay Stephen uh, I think uh, less so for me because, you know, I've worked in central London offices all, all of my career apart from the one year in um, in Leeds. And obviously that's, you know, we're going through a big moment of change right now in terms of how people use offices. But I wouldn't say, you know, it was me spotting anything. I think it's more to do with slightly um, a mindset approach. So my mindset is, is totally inquiring all the time, totally challenging all the time. Um, I ask 10,000 annoying questions all day, like why, 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 always on the why and the so what. And I think, um, you know, that combined with a, um, a pretty, like I say earlier, pretty ferocious focus on trying to achieve probably um, helped me along the way. But it wasn't, I wasn't anything, like I say, I wasn't anything special spotting something that nobody else had spotted before. Okay, thank you. Um, Philip? Well, I certainly come a long way from doing... Um, rent reviews and lease reviews for the Midland Bank to doing high level technical due diligence on um, major real estate in Grosvenor Square, for example, um, and or from, from actually one end of the country to the other. So um, 
to do that, I mean, I remember when I started in 1993, I basically on a desk and a telephone, the good idea, but no business plan, no clients, no nothing. And I've had to make it as it were, uh, uh, make it as it were. It's taken a long time. And I have to say that whilst we now sort of accept that climate changes here and environmental issues are really important, we've all sort of adopted that, that, that area, that, 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 mid, that space. But for many decades, at least until the uh, early noughties, no one was interested. Uh, in fact, uh, lots of funds looked at environmental issues as a distressed purchase. They didn't want to know about flood risk. They didn't want to know about contaminated land. Just tick the box and move on. Now, they want to know. They want to know about these existential threats. They want to know what it means to their asset base. They want to know how to manage their assets in a changing climate. And that's where, you know, changing your career and evolving your career uh, does take um, lots of energy and being prepared to accept from all sectors new ideas and new precepts and new concepts and to challenge the old ones uh, to make sure that you're not still thinking the same way and thinking differently because change thinking promotes improvement. Thank you. And, and, and you're, you're quite humble in that, um, I, I, from my perspective as a former environmental lawyer, you more or less launched a whole new branch of surveying. Um, do you want to take any credit for that? Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I was, I was the only, I was the first chartered environmental surveyor because I made sure I was. But also, um, I made sure that we RICS had a voice because we weren't articulating it bec because of the way in which. RICS historically was organized into silos. We weren't thinking across the piece and, the, and, jo and joining up the dots. I do massive amounts of work now with building surveyors, with quantity surveyors, with developers and so on and so forth. And it's working across those different disciplines and being able to be agile enough to work and, and think in new ways, but also to set yourself apart from the ologies, as I call them, the ologist the biologists, the geologists, the hydrogeologists, because you've got to think in a different, a completely different way and uh, apply yourself differently. But thank you for the compliment. Thank you. Uh, Diane. Thank you. The beauty of the land valuation department is that we are governed by our primary legislation. And that's effectively our Bible. And um, um, it's quite awesome, actually, because, you know, you're all familiar with the old program, yes, minister, you know, I, I can literally tell my minister get stuffed <laughs> if it doesn't afford, you know, or accord with, with what's in my legislation. So that's where I take my um, <laughs> directions from. However, it doesn't negate, you know, the fact that we have, I have to keep, you know, my finger on the pulse as to what is happening, you know, in the industry. Uh, Bermuda, as many know, um, is a British overseas dependent territory. So a lot of our legislation is built on uh, UK case law, um, you know, and, and our legislation in particular, the um, um, General Finance um, Act. So, um, yeah, but like I said, it, you know, you have to keep your finger on the pulse um, and particularly in, you know, not so much also in uh, my field, but just, you know, in my position um, as director, you know, I'm responsible for, you know, leadership and operational management and strategic vision of the department. And it's always looking at, you know, efficiencies uh, with, within government, within the department, you know, how can we best uh, deliver uh, our statutory mandate? So, so yeah, that'll be my response. Thank you very much. Okay, very quick final question for each of you. Um, and you, you're, you're limited to one sentence on, on, these, on this particular reply. What is your inspirational sentence for a student graduating as you know, part of the class of COVID uh, from uh, Sheffield Hallam's uh, real estate degrees uh, this year? What's your, what's your top tip for uh, how they should see the, the world ahead and perhaps position themselves for it? So uh, no pressure. Ian. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say just roll your sleeves up, you know, and uh, get involved, get yourself out there, uh, make a name for yourself and be proactive. And, uh, you know, don't just lie down and think, oh God, this is hard, hard yards. When it's hard yards, that's when you've got to keep going the most. Great. Stephen? Uh, 
to stick with your brief in one sentence, do what other people will not do. Yeah, like it's finding a job, whatever it is, do, do what other people are not willing to do. Okay, as long as it's legal. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. But, you know, do what others won't do to, 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 get, to get somewhere yeah, where you want to be. Okay. Uh, Philip? It's your time. Grasp it. Okay, that, that was a sentence. Lovely. <laughs> and uh, Diane? Yeah, you need to basically step out of your comfort zone, take risks, and just put yourself out there. Lovely. Right. Well, that, that, that gives a very clear message to uh, all the students listening into this. So uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, one and all, for panel one. I'm now going to hand over to uh, uh, James. Uh, James is going to steer uh, panel two. Uh, so over to you, James. <clears throat> I'll do my best, Luke. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. I'm James Johnston, Head of Development and Alumni Relations at the University. So my team were with the department to engage alumni all across the world who studied real estate um, and urban land economics. So it's really nice that we're in a business of, of, of cycles and it's, it's great what Philip was saying there about Science Park and how he was involved with that many, not so many moons ago, Philip, um, but how the university is still uh, developing that site and, um, and how uh, real estate plays a really important part of the university's future and also the city of Sheffield post um, John Lewis announced recently. So um, I'm going to let the panel speak for five minutes um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll come to some questions. Um, we're, we're here to talk about what success looks like. Um, and I think that's really important from a kind of personal perspective. I think the panel members are going to come at, it, come at it from that, but also really to think about over the past year that we've all learned through our professional connections that we have bigger roles to play uh, in the world that we we engage with as work and there's a fantastic opportunity there for our recent grads and our students really I think moving forward so Ian I'm going to come to you first as one of our um, uh, fantastic year of 79 who've done some 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 really nice things for the university recently yeah thanks very much uh, good evening everyone I'm Ian Middleton I'm not going to talk about the uh, scholarships tonight I'm going to talk about success um, until Retirement 18 months ago, I was Joint Managing Director of Smith Young, which some of you will know is one of the leading shopping centre consultancies in the UK based in Sheffield. And uh, my reflections are as one of your predecessors, having graduated 40, 40 or so years ago from what was then Sheffield Poly, ULE 79. And thanks to Luke, um, I've been given the task of trying to attempt to tell you in just five minutes how to get to the top of something uh, to leave you with some inspiration and insight into what my 40 years of real estate tells me about the characteristics that I think will help you to get ahead and to be successful. I'm going to approach that in three parts, identifying, I've counted them, 15 characteristics you'd think about. I'm going to sketch out my credentials by describing the success of Smith Young, the company that I was at the heart of for 25 years. Then I'll take a step back and consider more broadly what is success. And then I'll conclude with some practical examples of how to progress based around an outline of my, my route map. So just before I do that, I'm reflecting on all the events and the enormous challenges of the past 40 years, three cornerstones that I think will improve your prospects will follow. Perstability, lots of people have touched on this, it's the ability to get on with people, properties really closely knit. Adaptability, there's been lots of change and you're going to need to deal with it. So be ready and willing, and integrity, be true, and to use a word that Luke used last week, authentic to yourselves and to others. Okay, so to Smith Young, which, my, which was my high, high point, my accomplish, accomplishments there um, really um, will make me very proud of what we managed to achieve. I, I joined in um, 94 and was uh, I reached the position of managing director in 2005, retiring, as I say, in 2019. Now, Smith Young was formed in 1990, just as we went into recession, so a difficult time as a single purpose agency to serve the metal development. And I joined in 94 to take responsibility for the first round of rent reviews in late 95. Uh, and, then, and unusually in business, we restricted our activity, focus on Meadowhall, until 2001, when we secured invitations to do similar work on Blue Water and Trafford. Word of our success and uh, recognition in Property Week in 2005 as Professional Agency of the Year 
attracted other appointments. And 10 years ago, a real highlight, we got on board with Westfield in collaboration with CBRE to deal with all the rent reviews and the lease expiries on both of their London malls, London and Stratford, meaning that we were then engaged on all, all of the top five super regional malls working for the biggest retail investors. And to put some numbers on that, the capital value of those schemes we worked on topped 14 billion pounds and the combined rents receivable were in excess of 500 million a year. So very proud that we secured those instructions and in the face of continuous competition, kept them for 30 years or so in the case of Meadowhall. And that success is down to some very clear um, characteristics. Talent, you've got to have it. Hard work, everybody capable of working hard. Expertise and authority in your own subject. So get clued up. Careful preparation. Um, an obvious passion and enjoyment of what you do, patience, persistence, consistency, and ultimately results that exceed expectations. So getting back to this idea of what is success, I've just described what looks like a good story of business success. And it's a positive outcome. And I think that's a really good way to summarize su success. Success is a positive outcome. But what I'd impress upon you is that my business success, as described, is only part of something bigger, which is life as a whole. And you, you can't really escape the fact that work is likely to consume a large part of the 40 years of your life between 20 and 60. So it really matters what you do there, but do try to look at success with, with wider measures of your well being. Um, if you talked to me 10 or 15 years ago and started talking to me about well being, I would have wondered what you were talking about. I just wanted to get on with the job. But as you get older, you reflect and it just becomes ever more apparent. Um, but as I say, talking about my business success tells you nothing about the compromises, setbacks and disappointments we experience and the other aspects of life, health, wealth, happiness, friends. And if you get any of those wrong, then your business success could be of limited consolation. Ultimately, I was fortunate to secure great control over the business aspect of my life. And that's what you should try to do. Um, it relied on the exploitation of opportunities and plenty of effort to get there. And for much of the time, it wasn't like that. It may never be, but strive for it. So I'd say, look at success as a very fluid state, one that you can have and lose in its different aspects. It's a complex puzzle. Just take a broad view. And you're the only one that can really judge it effectively. It's best left to you. You can look at measures from elsewhere but you decide whether you're successful or not. You'll be happier with that. Uh, and here, the characteristic, which some have touched on tonight, is self-awareness. Be ever mindful of your circumstances. Pick up measures of your success in its many guises as you go along and enjoy it. Expect setbacks and diversions. Deal with them. Don't spend time regretting steps you didn't take. Be responsible and proactive. And just to conclude, then, my path um, as quickly as I can, pre-1978, Decided against the residential sector because there's too much client emotion tied up in that for me. Had a year out then, British Road Property Board, great variety of work, great team, free train travel. I loved that. Um, the work as well. Right, 79, graduated with a 2 2, a bit disappointed with that, but I pretty soon got over it once I got a job, uh, which was at Sheffield City Council. I wanted a job in Sheffield. I liked what the council offered in terms of quality and variety of work. And that's that's useful to get in your early stages. It broadens in all probability your opportunities and makes you better informed to navigate your career path. We handle industrial premises, offices, shops, council house sales, compulsory purchase. Um, but I didn't see my future in the public sector and I left after three years. Had to move to Leeds to go to GUS, where purely commercial premises, they were an investment company. And it was a very aggressive working environment, big contrast to the council. But that was a great lesson, great um, learning experience. And the characteristics here to survive and prosper were four, four of my favourites. Energy, work ethic, curiosity and attention to detail. 1987, age 30, I was looking for something a little less stressful uh, with a retail focus and got a retail surveyor position at Burton's in Leeds. Um, as well as being the sector I most enjoyed, it was such a social place. All the retail agents wanted to connect with Burton's as the dominant force on the high street. And it presented great opportunities to put your name around and take on work that got you noticed. You've got to get yourself noticed if you're going to get ahead. Six years or so into that, progressing pretty well, um, but a bit concerned that um, 
the office might move to London and I couldn't see my opportunities for progression and I was wondering what to do a bit and then literally out of the blue I got an invitation to a deal closing meeting at Meadowhall on some work I was doing for the tenant there and the developer Eddie Healy said come and work for us on the 1995 rent review project which was a bit inconvenient as uh, we were about to have our second child um, and as is the way with these things another job offer came out of the blue at exactly the same time so that was a retail job and I had to decide do I move do I not do I go for the retail job in my comfort zone or do I go for shopping centre landlord role which I've not done before weighing things up took the chance and uh, best thing I ever did so final conclusion to be successful in the real estate business as in others I think I would advise that you first experiment and try to find an area of work that you really enjoy in my case it was retail rent reviews something about which you can be passionate and have pride in about what you do. Work really hard at it, try to excel and don't be deterred or discouraged by negative influences. Be prepared to take risks and recognise that clients want solutions, not problems. So identify obstacles and ways to overcome them. More broadly though, to be successful, uh, take, the, take the wider view. That's me. Thanks Ian. Uh, very wise words, and if anyone's got any questions for Ian, please put them in the chat or we'll come on to them at the end. Now, I'm going to move on to Louise, Louise Brooksmith, um, who is one of our ULE alumni, but she's also an honorary graduate from the university, um, which was a very splendid day a couple of years ago, Louise. Uh, you're going to give us further wise words, and I'm going to just hand over to you. Thank you. I know we're running a bit over time because no surveyor can keep to five minutes, can they? It's just not in our, in our DNA. Um, uh, my name, as, as uh, James has very kindly says, Louise Brooksmith, uh, and I've had a career uh, across the built environment, both in the public and private sectors and in the UK and internationally um, for nearly 40 years. Um, I've been asked to speak specifically on having confidence to make your own career path. So here goes. Um, I think really I can talk about it because my mantra has always been to make the most of the opportunities that come your way. You are going to hear the same messages from everybody who speaks today. But that's my mantra. It's, it's make the most of those opportunities because they might not come your way again. And that way, your career path can take different twists and turns, but it will always be interesting. I'll, I'll put money on it. You, it'll be interesting. Confidence to take up opportunities is, 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 is important. You've got to have that confidence. It doesn't have to be embedded confidence. You don't have to be born confident. It can be learned. And it simply needs you to have an element of trust and an ability to take a few risks on your journey. It helps to have supporters and mentors, whether that's your family or your friends or your boss or your work colleagues, but it also helps to know who has your back and who doesn't have your back because you are bound to find people that you don't get on with along the way. And it's really important to recognise them, but recognise the people who are allies as well, because you can do it on your own. You need to be happy in yourself and with yourself, regardless of your faults. And believe me, we have all got a lot of faults. You can't really pretend to be something you're not or hide behind a mask. People see through facades eventually and you lose their trust. So all those little bits there um, were instilled in me by my parents when I was setting out. And, and, and it, it meant basically that I meant the most of, of really crap A-levels. I remember turning up at Sheffield Poly in the early 1980s with some appalling A-levels through clearing. Um, and I ended up on urban land economics. I'd started on housing, transferred, went to um, uh, join the urban land economics course. Um, I also joined um, the RICS as a student member, one, because it was free, and two, I'd never heard of the RICS before and I thought it looked quite good fun. Um, that move and joining as a student member meant that I got involved in a network, a professional network that carried on and has carried on throughout my whole career. The people I met based back in Sheffield and through various jobs 
Um, and all the people I've met in the RICS have been very important to me. I, I eventually became a global president of the RICS and I am still very much involved. But back in the beginning, back at Sheffield Poly, I was one of two women on that course. And I then eventually chose a specialism that I liked best because there's no point in doing something you don't really enjoy. It wasn't the popular one, it was the P&D option. And there were a handful of people who chose P&D, planning and development. And that's what I got my degree in. Um, and I was really pleased. I don't know who said anything about a 2-2. I was delighted to have got a 2-2 after completely screwing up my A-levels, I can tell you. Um, I met very interesting people um, early in my career and um, ended up um, not choosing to, but it sort of was a bit of a jigsaw of um, uh, public sector and then private sector. I joined um, Sheffield, uh, sorry, um, Coventry City Council and, and then uh, um, ended up being very lucky and having a, a very lucky break and ending up working as a surveyor out in Africa in Zaire. Um, I, I just blagged a lot about being able to use a theodolite. Um, but um, anyway, they offered me the job and I ended up working in Zaire for an aid agency. That led to positions in India and Asia. And I ended up working for the UN in, um, in East Africa. It gave me a really broad view of the world and an understanding to get a range of experience under my belt. And also the enthusiasm to um, do it for myself, basically, to set up my own business. Um, I'd also gathered various other roles. I'd, I'd worked for a very large agency um, in the UK and I worked for Birmingham City Council. Anyway, I took risks um, and I ended up setting up my own business in Birmingham as a consultant um, some time ago now, over 30 years ago. Um, that business grew. I merged it with another firm. I did a management buyout, bought it back. I then grew it through a recession and eventually um, I sold it on to one of the biggest consultancies in the world, and that was Arcadis, where I became a senior partner and um, headed up the planning offer. Um, I'm now an advisor uh, and a non-executive director for a whole range of companies and organizations and FTSE companies, using all that property development and construction experience and skills and the networks I've, I've, I've formed. And most importantly, I love what I do. I always have loved what I do. Um, I've never done anything for the money. Um, my view is um, it's not a good enough reason for getting out of bed just to be able to you know, get a paycheck. There is no point in doing anything if you really don't enjoy it. So my takeaways very quickly are be yourself, find your tribe, aim high and take a few risks along the way. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. Sorry, I was, I was writing down quotes from you there. So I think that's a really important one about find your tribe. Thank you very much. Again, questions for Louise into the box or we'll pick them up at the end. Um, we're moving on to um, two people who are not Helm graduates, but we're going to we're going to let them off on that, that point. That's absolutely fine. Um, and I'm going to bring in Sarah Hayford, who's going to talk to you about kind of her views on how we broaden inclusion and diversity in the real estate business. Hi, Sarah. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Hayford, and I'm the founder of CEO of a company called The Land Collective. And The Land Collective is basically an organisation that I built when I was at university. I actually went to the University of Nottingham and I studied international relations and politics as my first degree. And I later on got into property and I really wanted to become a commercial surveyor. So I took the steps after that to do my master's in real estate. And I worked in the industry for a few years, starting off as a graduate surveyor, mostly in West End retail agency. And then I moved on to clients. So I didn't really like um, the agency life too much. So I wanted something a little bit different. So I went to go and work at Wasabi as an estate surveyor, still in the retail and F&B sector. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, but ultimately I'm here today because I want to talk to you a bit more about the Land Collective and the work that we've been doing to increase not only kind of brain representation in the sector, but also you know, the industry visibility as a whole um, when I was starting to get into property, the main kind of difficulty that I found was that 
you know, I didn't really just have, I didn't really have a lot of access. So, you know, when I was looking online about, you know, to increase my commercial awareness, I didn't really know where to look. Everything was behind the paywall. When I wanted to go to events and network with other professionals, you had to pay. Some of these events cost like 100, 100, 200 pounds, stuff like that. It was ridiculous for a student to kind of get her foot in the door. So I decided to create my own door, basically. So I started off by creating the Land Collective and it started off as a blog actually. And basically I was blogging about different things that I cared about. So at the time it was things like regeneration, gentrification, um, developments in my local area, um, constructions on new projects and things like that. And I started to get my friends involved as well. Um, and I think when you're at uni and you're, everyone's kind of looking for experience, everyone wants something to put on their CV. So I kind of got all my friends involved. I got my university department involved because I kind of sold it as a way of students um, learning more about commercial awareness and actually applying things related to the built environment um, to put on their CVs. And that's how we kind of got started. But over the last kind of four years now, we've grown significantly and that's mainly because that we've kind of changed our offering so where we kind of started off at the beginning um kind of writing blogs and it was all about students and it was all about getting your opinions across we started to really kind of narrow down our audience so it then kind of developed into breaking down really difficult and hard to learn concepts around kind of the built environment so what is a lease what are your rights when you know um your relationship with your landlord goes kind of tits up or whatever things like that so we started doing those kinds of things and eventually we got to a point where we wanted to start doing more programs to try and get more people looking at the built environment as a sector just because we felt that visibility just wasn't really you know when you compare the sector to areas like law finance banking and then you ask people about property, for example, they're like, oh, yeah, you could be an estate agent. I know that. And it's like, OK, but what else? You know, so we wanted to kind of change that perception with young people, especially from kind of lower income backgrounds. Um, so before, when I was getting into the sector, I did a whole range of unpaid and paid internships. I did an internship at CBRE in the residential department. I worked for a company called Located, which is basically a government agency that focuses on the development of free schools. Um, I interned at Land Securities in their development and retail team. And it was quite hard to get all of those opportunities. And I really had to kind of prove myself on my application to prove that even though I came from a political background, I was really, really interested in the sector and that I'd done the work and I'd done the research that I needed in order to get into it. So one of my reasons for kind of starting the Land Collective and for trying to get more representation into the sector is just because the sector isn't really diverse. I think it's getting a lot better, um, but there's still a long way to go. And I feel that firms have tried to do their best in relation to these things by building out networks and events where we talk constantly about diversity, how to improve it, what we're doing. Um, but on all levels, it still has a long way to go. So that's definitely something that we're working on with the Land Collective, trying to get more young people in from various different backgrounds, um, breaking down barriers to entry, and also just making them aware of the built environment sector as a viable career option. I know for me, when I told my dad I was going into property, he was just like, to do what <laughs> exactly you know I was the one in the family who was studying politics uh, he thought I was going to be saving the world in the UN and then it's just like oh yeah you're going to go sell houses and it was like no <laughs> actually I'm going to go be a commercial surveyor and do amazing things and you know put companies and businesses on the high street and stuff like that so I think you know talking to more parents about different options in the industry and you know just getting in front of more people was something that we all have a responsibility to do and it's something that we have consistently worked on at the Land Collective we have great relationships with different employers last year we launched um, our virtual internship program um, we we're one of the first in the industry to kind of do it and it was on a really large scale we collaborated with great employers such as Gardner and Theobald um, Colleagues International and also Brian K. Layton and Paisner, which are a commercial law firm. We had over 300 students sign up and it was such an amazing experience because, you know, 
after the pandemic came along and has ruined everything, um, lots of companies took back their internship places. Um, so we decided that we were going to create our own and it was a great way where students could actually learn more about commercial property and construction. They could learn more about landlord and tenant, property management, leasing, and actually build up those skills and that knowledge and decide what they wanted to do with it later on. So it was a really, really great year for us. And we're hoping to do the same again this year. But ultimately, the one thing that we're trying to solve here is kind of representation, diversity. But at the end of the day, you know, we can't achieve those things if people don't know that the sector even exists in the first place. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about my journey. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I just had a quick question on that before we move on to Jack, um, which is, is, is there more of a role that um, companies can play in, in, or is it that you see it as more of a, a pipeline of, of talent coming through via universities? I think it's both. I think everyone has a different role to play. I think that employers have a bulk of it, to be honest. Um, you know, it's about kind of fostering a really comfortable and amazing working culture where people actually feel comfortable to come to your workplace as either a person of colour or as a woman and things like that. So it's both a pipeline issue and an employer issue. And we're working with quite a lot of employers at the moment to kind of help them with their kind of diversity training, with their hiring process, and even, even kind of smaller scale things, like for example, their recruitment process. If their recruitment process actually isolates people or, um, you know, puts people off applying if it's too long if you have to visit the office um all day or something like that so you know we're trying to break down really kind of small barriers to entry one by one but i think everyone has a role to play definitely yeah thanks for that and and um, we'll probably come on to that a bit that theme a bit later but it's incredibly important and i think the university's certainly been doing a lot of work in this space over the past uh, couple of years and recently has the accolade of being the uh, university in the UK that recruits the most students from underrepresented backgrounds. So it's something we're very proud of at Hallam and has an important link to how we engage with, with businesses. Um, Jack, I'm going to bring you in at this point. You're going to talk to us about how um, local communities can benefit from real estate businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, James. And I, I have to say, I, I probably feel like the biggest imposter on this panel because not only did I not go to Sheffield Hallam, um, I actually don't come from a real estate background either. So it, it, it does link in. Um, but basically, I, I've had a strange, slightly strange career journey. Um, I actually started off in commercial law. So I went to the University of Newcastle um, and graduated in 2011 with a law degree, was was very lucky to secure a, a training contract with a commercial law firm. And I thought, right, that's that's what I'm going to go and do. I'm going to go and be a commercial lawyer. If you'd told me when I was 21 that 10 years later, I'd be a responsible business manager for a real estate business, I'd have been very surprised probably. Um, but for me, what, what happened with my career was I, I started uh, my journey with, with the commercial law firm I worked for. And it was just the wrong fit. I, I, you know, I, I loved the team. I loved the firm I was working for, but the job wasn't quite right. And what I found was that actually the the skills that I was most enjoying using were, were the more of the interpersonal skills and working with clients and solving problems. Um, and and it was very much the people side. And one of the things I got involved in at the firm was I'd got involved in a charity committee, and we'd started supporting a charity in Sheffield called St Luke's Hospice. And I'd, I'd absolutely loved that. I'd built some great relationships there. And so when I, when I, you know, when I kind of parted ways very amicably with the law firm I was working for, um, I just went to see St. Luke's and just said, look, I'm, I'm interested in potentially moving into the charity sector. What tips would you give anyone who wants to do a fundraising job? And they had a job and I went for it and I got it and, and the rest was kind of history there. So I was there for five and a half years. Absolutely loved it. I worked with uh, lots of different businesses on, on their kind of corporate fundraising and, and one of the businesses that I built up a, a very close relationship with was Henry Boot. I'm sure you'll probably have heard of Henry Boot. We're uh, one of the kind of largest, um, I suppose, real estate businesses, certainly in this region, but we operate nationally. So we're a PLC and we operate right across the, the built environment sector. And I, I, I really admired them as a business because not only were they very successful financially, but actually they they just had this real ethos of responsibility and this very kind of strong link to the community they worked in. 
so when they when they were looking for a responsible business manager i thought that's that's my next step that's what i want to go and do and was very lucky to apply and get that job and so i i guess what i wanted to kind of share a little bit about was about how businesses can give back but i just wanted to tie in my story to some of the things the other panelists have said which is absolutely seize opportunities and please almost don't don't try and envisage what your whole career is going to look like, because at 21, it's very difficult to imagine what you're going to be doing when you're 60, 65, 70. It, it, careers aren't necessarily straight lines and, you know, doors will open for you at various stages. And I think what others have said is right, is be willing to take risks and be willing to seize opportunities. Um, in, in terms of my role now for Henry Boot, what I do, uh, I, I work across our group of companies to, to take a strategic look about how we are acting as a responsible business. And, and I think as you kind of go through university and you start out in your career, there's a lot of focus on financial success, you know, earning a good salary, working for a business that's, that's very kind of successful financially. What's been a really interesting trend, and, and even in the six months I've been with Henry Boot, is that actually it's the non-financial performance that is gaining in importance and that you might hear the term ESG which stands for environmental social and governance and, and what that means is you can be the most financially successful business going but if you haven't got a good look at how you are interacting with other elements of society <clears throat> if you haven't got a good look at how you are acting sustainably then potentially you can get yourself into to real kind of difficult situations and, and actually taking a strategic look at that and, and looking at where you can have the most impact will, will lead to real success. So what, I guess what I wanted to talk about was that I think there's two strands to responsibility as a business as you start your careers. Firstly, it's the businesses you work for. And I think it's, it's, it's thinking actually, what, what kind of businesses do you want to work for? What values are you looking for? And as businesses, I think there's a, there's a real change that's going to happen as we kind of come out of COVID. And I think what, what I hope we'll see is that businesses will stop um i suppose almost kind of stop looking at societal issues as, as issues that aren't directly relevant to them and kind of i suppose supporting communities from an arm's length but actually we'll move to a much more collaborative model so we'll see businesses really engaging with charities and education providers and community organizations to tackle shared problems and there's the ethical reason for doing that. We know it's the right thing to do, but commercially it will help us all solve issues that, that are a big problem. You know, Sarah mentioned lack of diversity, skills gaps, all, all these challenges that actually are our responsibility to solve. But rather than just doing that at an arm's length, it will be looking at how we can do that collaboratively, which is, is quite exciting. I think businesses as well, it, it, the, the key word that I kind of keep coming up against time and time again is authenticity. You know, if you if you treat responsibility and social value and ESG as tick box exercises, people can see that a mile off. And the best way for businesses to approach this is, is to be honest and say, look, you know, so for Henry Boot, for instance, we've got a great history of responsibility, but we're not perfect. We've got a lot left to do. We've got a real a, a really exciting road to go on in, in my mind. And I, and I think people admire that honesty and that authenticity to say we're going to put the effort in to get there. I think the other strand is, is for you as individuals, it's thinking about what responsibility can you share? So even, even kind of been in the room where you are now, you know, getting to Sheffield Hallam, studying the course you're studying, you, you've already experienced success. You've already got yourself to a place where others haven't got to. And I think it's about thinking, how can you share that success? So as you move forward in your careers, as you're kind of looking forward and, and progressing, how can you look back and help others, others get there as well? How can you open up doors for other people? And, you know, I think for me, my, my father-in-law uh, was a director of a, a quite a successful real estate business. <clears throat> and whenever we spoke about his career, he never talked about how much money he made. He never talked about the financial value of deals or what was the most profitable year. He talked about the legacy of the projects he worked on. He would point out and say, we built that or we helped this charity or we, you know, we achieved this together. So I think the one thing I would say is think beyond the financial responsibility isn't just about you know earning as much money as you can to be to then give it back it's 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 thinking beyond that financial kind of way of thinking and and, and really thinking about what purpose do you want to go forward with your career um so hopefully james that's some helpful tips very helpful jack and i think that 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 ties nicely into what sarah was saying about um diversity and inclusion and, and certainly I know other members of the panel will, will kind of have some views on this. Could I just ask the other members of the panel to put 
their cameras on, I've turned their cameras on, and then we'll just have a few questions, if that's all right. I've, I've jotted down a few notes um, on this. Um, so just picking up on your point, Jack, about responsibility, you sort of hit on a couple of points there, one of which is about <clears throat> corporate responsibility and that kind of social contract that, that businesses have, and real estate plays a big part in that, particularly post-pandemic, and we've, we've seen a lot of that kind of coming up in the news. But there's the other thing about that's really helpful for our final year students and, and graduates, which is about how, how do they model that almost in, 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 in what they do. Uh, and Louise, I don't, I'm going to come to you first on this because I don't know whether you have any views on this. And I, always, I always love your story about the National Coal Board, but there is that thing, isn't there, about um, resilience and taking forward those lessons and challenging the barriers that might be there. What you want me to relay my coal board story? <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly. <laughs> I'm sure other people have heard it so many times. So um, I didn't want, I, I had no idea what surveying was or, or, or the property world. I wanted to be an engineer. Um, and I, my A levels were all geared towards uh, studying mining engineering at the, the Royal School of, at the um, at Imperial College. And I completely buggered up my A levels. Um, so not only didn't I get physics, which is quite important to do engineering. I screwed all the rest of them up as well. Um, but before I got the results, I'd applied to the National Coal Board for a scholarship. And um, just by chance, my dad said, well, apply, of course apply. You know, you, I've got to apply. But um, do two applications. Do one as Miss Brooksmith and do the other one as Mr Brooksmith. Because the equal ops um, legislation had come in only a few years beforehand. It was embedding in... Um, so I sent my both my forms off and um, um, Mr. Brooksmith got a letter back saying, um, oh, well done, thank you very much, you can come for an interview, we're really interested in offering you a scholarship. Miss Brooksmith got this really shitty letter from them saying, what do you think you're applying to us for, basically. Um, and it was really, it was really badly crafted. And um, so I took them to the Equal Opportunities Commission and won. And um, uh, by that time, though, I'd won a bit of a hollow win because obviously I screwed up my A-levels and so I didn't go and do engineering anyway. So, But the fact that the National Coal Board hadn't actually grasped things at that point when legislation was very clearly in play, it, it, it stuck in my mind and it's, it's a good example. I have to say, I, I've not found as much prejudice or discrimination um, over my career, but that's probably because I've lived by the mantra that I, I set out before. Clearly, I have been very actively involved in um, EDI over the last um, 10, 20 years, and, and I, and I um, uh, was the, the instigator behind the, um, the Employers um, Equality Mark uh, for the RICS, which was the first quality mark for EDI across the built environment. It's still going, it's been adapted. And the, the position over EDI, over, over um, diversity and inclusion, has changed dramatically over the last five to ten years. Hugely, it's just unrecognisable now. Um, it's, it, it's got a long way to go, but it's considerably better than it used to be. And now, when people come out with crass statements, like an advert I saw only last week, on Twitter basically saying, lads, do you want a career in construction? I'm looking for some people to join my team. That, that jars so badly, that poor bugger who put that out on Twitter, um, he, got, he got slammed for it, not surprisingly. It's a cultural change that's required. That cultural change will change over time. It's getting quicker. Uh, but the change still needs to happen. So, um, you know, it's it, it still, it, you know, discrimination still still takes place or we wouldn't have the Black Lives Matter um, uh, work that, that is being done at the moment. But um, uh, it's getting better. Um, the horror stories are fewer and far up between, but the work of Sarah and lots of people like her mean that life is getting a little bit better and a little bit fairer. Thanks, Louise. Sarah or Ian, did you want to come on this? at all on equality uh yeah there's a long way to go when i that's quite funny when i started 40 years ago my first boss was a woman and so was my second boss and that was really unusual that was really unusual at the time but it's changed massively in the last uh in the last 15 or 20 years i would say and uh all there's so much more balance in that but it's the ethnic um 
this equality that really needs addressing. And the RICS are really trying to catch up on that, I think, from what I've seen from their website. And the big firms are taking lots of initiatives to try and improve things. I think the last research said just 2% of charter surveyors were from ethnic minority backgrounds. So there are massive opportunities there to try and even things up. So I, I'm working with Nandi uh, as a mentor, and I'm really excited at the prospect of getting her somewhere, which... Uh, um, she'll go far, I'm sure, but um, yeah, there is discrimination that needs tackling. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, so. definitely. Yeah, I think um, much like everyone else on the panel, still got a long way to go, but you know, I think um, just by the work that we're kind of doing with the Land Collective and you know, companies are kind of dedicated to making change. I think sometimes it's quite, I think um, Jack kind of mentioned it earlier about, you know, you really kind of recognize the companies that are approaching diversity and inclusion as a tick box, tick box exercise, because they're quite easy to kind of weed out. Um, but, you know, the kind of reception that the Land Collective has been getting um, just across the board has been really, really positive. And it shows you um, how dedicated the sector is towards change and towards kind of um, breaking down barriers so that everyone has a chance to become a surveyor or, you know, get into construction. And there's lots of different opportunities that are around that we kind of post consistently to our students and our community and our wider network. So it's, it's really, really exciting times. And, you know, our kind of background is just, we just want to make sure that this sector is open to everyone, that everyone can have a chance to get into it. So it's really, really great that people are on board for this change. And, and can I just add there that, that part of the problem is, is our industry perpetuating urban myths. I really think it does us more harm than good. There's a, there is a cultural change that's required. There is, a, there is a, an age element of, of all of this. But, but I, I, I get really cross when I sit on panels and we get, you know, indi individuals saying, oh, woe is me. You know, it's, it's, it's such a dreadful uh, career to enter and all the rest of it. To be quite honest, excuse my language, that's bollocks. It really is. Because it is it is fairer now than it, than it has ever been. And it is the exception that really jars out when there is poor practice or malpractice. You can call it out and it's far easier to call out now. The artist to shout out and do something about it. So I really don't like perpetuated urban myths. Thanks, Louise. Telling it like it is. Uh, it's true Louise style. Uh, but th there's, there's, a, there's a point there as well, isn't there, about we need to be equipped or, or, or graduates need to be equipped Absolutely. with all the skills and the tools. Um, there was something really nice that you said there about finding your tribe and taking it with you. Which And, and, and there's something there about networking, there's something there about allyship and mentoring. And I just wondered whether quickly you all had some kind of advice on that. Um, I definitely um, say on the kind of networking tip, I, when it, when it came to me um, getting into the sector, I fought really, really hard um, to get in. Like I was emailing directors um, from different firms, asking if they wanted to have a phone call and speak to me about their career and their journey, about what their department did. So I think when it comes to um, actually kind of networking opportunities and really kind of reaching out to people, students should really be well equipped to do that because you never know where those kinds of relationships can take you in the future. So there's, there's certain directors and senior leaders that I emailed when I was back at uni, um, just off the bat, because I wanted to find out a bit more about their roles and their departments, who I still speak to now. They still mentor me, they support the Land Collective and things like that. So you never really know how long these relationships can last. So I would say never feel afraid to approach people, just have a chat with them, um, talk about the lives, because so many people have had different journeys into this sector. And I feel like their personal experiences can also be quite well-meaning to you as well. So never be afraid to reach out and, you know, get creative on that front as well. You know, if, if you've realised that there's a gap somewhere, try and fill it, try and do something new, put that on your CV. Because, I mean, um, because of the pandemic, we all know that graduates are having a pretty tough time. Young people in general are having a pretty tough time when it comes to the job market. So you do kind of have to stand out. So, you know, join networks, you know, you being on this Zoom call is a great step as well. You know, add people on LinkedIn, chat with them, and just don't be afraid to reach out and grow your network organically. I, I would add to that that it's quite intimidating for young surveyors 
to go into a room of 200 other surveyors, older members of the profession, and try and engage with them. So I would suggest they buddy up with somebody at work and find out what their social diary work diary is like and, and go to do's with them. That was the way we used to do it. And uh, we used to bring younger members of our office into do's to try and get them an invite and, and they would make their own contacts and gain confidence more quickly that way. And don't always rely on, on um, emails. Emails can be dismissed really quickly. It's all, you know, if you, if you can, pick the damn phone up. It really does help. If you can pick the phone up, if you've got the balls enough to pick the phone up, get through to the MD of a company and say, hi, I really want to talk to you. And if this isn't a good time, let's, let's find a time when I could have a chat. Do you mind? Only five minutes. If you put that in an email, it'll go to, you know, his admin department, dismissed. So there are ways of getting through to people. And if you can make contact with, the, with people, even if it's only for five minutes, it can stick in people's minds for the right reasons. So, um, you know, just pick the phone up. We still do have mobiles. I think, you know, it's not all emails and texts. I, I think for me, James, I, on, on your question, I, I think the two things, I think allyship is, it, it isn't really a choice. It shouldn't be a choice anymore. It, so for businesses to to achieve equality and diversity, and, and it is a long road. We know our sector has struggled with representation and it is going to take time to put that right. But, it, you know, this is something that's everybody's responsibility. It's not a HR issue or something that only a certain team in a business should, should try and take care of. We've all got a role to play in this. And I think it's about embracing change and being, being willing to try new things and, and listen and learn. I think, I think on mentoring, I would just say, I think it works both ways. You know, be willing to learn from those above you, like Ian said, and, and to kind of, you know, get along to, to find out what, what your seniors do, but actually be willing to listen to those beneath you as well. And particularly with, with you guys, as you know, you're the next generation of the workforce coming in. Leaders have as much obligation to learn from you as you do from them at the moment, because there's so much change that, you know, it's a great opportunity for you to, to bring in your ideas and enthusiasm and, and for leaders to learn from that as well. Thanks, Jack. And I, what I'd say as well is, uh, and I would say this, is that um, we do have an alumni network out there and there are lots of alumni that can be contacted. You can get in touch with them through LinkedIn. If you go to the university's LinkedIn page, you can, you can look at the alumni module. Or we have another site which is called Hallam Collective, so you can log in there as a student and 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 source alumni from different backgrounds all across the world who are happy to just to have a, a virtual coffee. That's a really good way to do it. Um, I'm going to quickly wrap up because I know we're, we're, we're coming to that and I'll hand back to Luke, but just one final quick question for the panel, which is uh, what would you tell your final year self as you look back now? That's a, that's a tricky one. Sorry, I threw that in there at the end. Enjoy the trip. Enjoy, enjoy the ride. Don't worry too much about the future. It does all work out. You don't have to have a plan, but it helps. <laughs> and I would also say that networking across is just as important as networking up. Um, so make as many contacts and friends um, on your level and the same people going through the same things as you, um, because you'll be able to band together and combat more issues in the future. Thank you all. That's been fantastic uh, and great insights from all the panels there. I'm going to hand back to Luke. Thanks, James. Um, I'll keep this brief. I also want to make it sound, and it is very grateful. Um, the slide that you see uh, on screen uh, marks the end of a, uh, of a journey that um, uh, I and my colleagues in the real estate team here at Sheffield Hallam have been on this month. Um, it seemed like a crazy endeavor when we set out to do it, but we've, we've, we've done it, folks. Um, we've had 30 uh, alumni and uh, related contacts giving back the benefit of their success for the greater good. And that really is the message that um, was curated, if, if I'm allowed to be a curator, uh, into the event this evening. I wanted those stories of success, but by definition, the fact that people have given up their time to come and talk about their individual success but also to reflect on its wider uh, dimensions and where we should be uh, looking for 
uh, success uh, in the future has, has just been terrific. Uh, and we've got such rich content now. Uh, each of these sessions, as I said at the start, has been recorded. Uh, they'll be going up both for a teaching resource and also available for public consumption. Um, and just want to thank everybody involved in today's session and also the other three previous sessions uh, for giving up their time and giving us such such rich resource that I'm sure it's going to just keep giving uh, and giving. So thank you all uh, very much. I'll, I'll circulate information when we do have the uh, uh, YouTube uh, page up and running. Um, but for now, I wish you a, a, a pleasant evening. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Bye bye.